Okay, I'll start with the homage to the Buddha. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samama Samambo Tassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samama Samambo Tassa Namo December 17th, 2011. Okay, I have to start with an, an announcement or a request. Um, as we go on into the future, we're going to need a few people to help with the, we call this the internet connection and recording. So we need altogether three people, and we have one so far. Is there anybody else? Now, to help with this, we have to come here at 9 a.m., is that correct? And so we need people who will be willing to volunteer to come every week that we have the class. And I will have the class, we won't have it the next two weeks, because there's a retreat here, so we'll have the next class January 7th, and then I'll have three classes in January, January 7th, 14th, 21st. Then we'll break for the winter, and then we'll resume probably in the middle of March, and then continue from the middle of March on. And so do we have anybody who would be willing to come whenever we have the class, to be able to come at 9 a.m. to help set up the recording. Okay, that's good. And good if you would give your contact information to Bo Wei, who's sitting in front of the computer. Or to Kaidi? Okay, to Kaidi. That's one. You, you'll be able to come every time. Okay. Okay, so you would have to be here at 9 a.m. They only need to take turns. Oh, that's also a possibility, to rotate. Just to rotate. Yeah. Okay, so people can do it, you know, a few weeks, then take a break, then other people can take over. We'll start off with these three, then. Paul Way. Your name is? Nick. Nick. Nick is that? Yeah. Joan. Joan. Okay. Okay, so now we can come back to our sutta. And we have been doing, over the last few weeks, the Chula Atari, the Maha Rahula Ovada Sutta, the greater discourse of advice to Rahula. And this is the Buddha's instruction on various approaches to meditation to his own physical son, the young monk Rahula. And if you remember at the beginning, when the sutta opens, or close to the opening, Rahula gets some brief instructions from the Buddha. Then, after getting these instructions on contemplating the body, or the five aggregates as being non-self, he goes off and sits in meditation under a tree. And then Venerable Sariputta, who is the teacher of Rahula, sees him sitting there and instructs him to practice mindfulness of breathing. Venerable Sariputta says, Rahula, develop mindfulness of breathing. When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it is of great fruit and great benefit. Okay, so later that same day, Rahula goes to the Buddha and asks him, how does one practice mindfulness of breathing? 
But the Buddha doesn't answer Ramana's question straight away, but rather he goes first into a detailed explanation of contemplating the body in terms of the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and the space element. And then he gives him brief advice or admonitions to practice some of the other meditation subjects. The four sublime states or divine dwellings, loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy, and equanimity. Then the meditation on the unattractive nature of the body or foulness. And then the meditation on impermanence. And we can see, perhaps, that the Buddha is preparing Ramala for instructions on mindfulness of breathing. And it's somewhat interesting that, you know, when anybody comes to learn Buddhist meditation, <laughs> to a meditation teacher or a meditation center, almost the first instruction that is given is mindfulness of breathing. So we always think of mindfulness of breathing, this is sort of like the ABC of meditation. And then when you learn, after you learn mindfulness of breathing, then you get into the real stuff. <laughs> what lies beyond mindfulness of breathing, whether it's vipassana or in the Zen tradition, called shikantaza or kawas meditation, or in Tibetan meditation, they call Dzogchen or Mahabhudra. So those are taken to be like, you know, the real stuff. And mindfulness of breathing is like learning the ABCs. That's the common assumption. But actually, according to the text, the Buddha himself used mindfulness of breathing as his own vehicle to the attainment of enlightenment. So when the Buddha sat down under the Bodhi tree on the night of his enlightenment, the practice that he cultivated was mindfulness of breathing. And we find that many of the great disciples themselves practiced mindfulness of breathing. And again and again throughout his teaching career, the Buddha emphasized the practice of mindfulness of breathing. And not only for beginners. And it seems here in this sutta, that the Buddha is preparing the way to mindfulness of breathing by instructing Rahula and these other meditation subjects in order to clear away the hindrances or mental obstacles so that then Rahula, when he enters mindfulness of breathing, he will have a smoother course of development. And so the main hindrances, normally the main hindrances of the mind, we have the five hindrances, and of the five hindrances, the two coarse or gross hindrances are the first two, sensual desire, sensual craving, and ill will, anger, or hatred. And so the preliminary meditation subjects loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy, can be seen as the antidotes to anger and ill will. And then the meditation on the unattractive nature of the body is the direct antidote to sensual desire. And also the perception of impermanence also will help to reduce desire desire or craving. And then the hindrance or mental block that was especially strong in Rahula's mind was his pride based on his own physical beauty. Because he was a young man in the prime of life. Apparently he was quite handsome, physically well built. He's 18, according to the commentary, 18 years old. So he's full of what the suttas call the pride of youth, the pride of good health, and the pride of life or vitality. And so the Buddha teaches him the four elements meditation. 
in order that he can gain some insight into the nature of the body and in this way reduce his pride or his attachment based on the body. And so, after all of this preliminary, these preliminary instructions have been laid down, then the Buddha probably feels that Rahula is now been sort of properly prepared so that he can absorb and practice the instructions on mindfulness of breathing. And so now in paragraph 25, he starts the actual instructions, or actually in pa- paragraph 24, he repeats the injunction on mindfulness of breathing. So after completing all the other meditation subjects, then he introduces Anapanasati. He says, develop meditation on mindfulness of breathing. When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it is of great fruit and great benefit. And how is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated so that it's of great fruit and great benefit? Okay, first what we call mindfulness of breathing in Pali, I'll write the Pali name. Okay, so mindfulness of breathing is anapanasati. The word ana means the in-breath, and pana means the out-breath, and sati means mindfulness. It's actually ana and up, I think it's... No, I'm sorry, it's anapana. Sati. And, okay, sati is mindfulness. And sometimes we find, this is in the Sanyutta Nikaya, in the section on mindfulness of breathing, we find the instructions are given for anapana sati samadhi, which means concentration. Samadhi is concentration, collectedness of mind, mental composure, through mindfulness of breathing. So this full expression brings out the, sort of the direction of anapanasati. The reason that one is developing mindfulness of breathing is to obtain the samadhi, the concentration, that is reached through being mindful of the in and out breaths. Okay, so now the Buddha begins the instruction in paragraph 25, and he begins with the sort of elementary steps in practicing mindfulness of breathing. So he says, here are the, the bhikkhu or a monk, gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut. Okay, so this begins by explaining the ideal, by mentioning the ideal places for practicing mindfulness of breathing. So because the objective is to be able to keep the mind consistently on the breath, so it's important to have a somewhat secluded and quiet place So the ideal place in the Buddha's time for monastics was to go to the forest. 
No, actually, what's interesting, if you've ever lived in a forest, you know, it's not so quiet there. <laughs> There's lots of, especially at night, insects come out, chirping, and birds singing, and different kinds of night out owl, night animals prowling around, and growling and howling. But for some reason, my own experience, those kinds of sounds are not disturbing. It actually adds to the peacefulness. <laughs> okay, and then within the forest or in a place like the grove where the Buddhist monasteries were situated, the ideal place, at least according to the text, is to sit at the root of a tree. But if you've ever tried sitting outside at the root of either the root of a tree or anywhere outside, what also beats annoying problems, <laughs> like especially mosquitoes. You know, so what's developed in at least the Thai meditative tradition is they use a device, I think it's pronounced krot. It's constructed like an umbrella, but it has a big overhead parasol, and then suspended from the parasol is a mosquito net. So when you sit down, you hang the crud from the branch of a tree and then you spread out the net so it surrounds the body to protect you from the mosquitoes. Okay, so the root of a tree or an empty hut, this would be just, we call a kuti, a little hut or cottage in a quiet place. And if you don't have the luxury of the forest, the root of a tree or an empty hut, just choosing in your house, your apartment, a quiet room where you won't be disturbed, where, especially a place that's dedicated to the practice of meditation. So when you practice there you know, daily, over time, you're building up peaceful, harmonious vibrations in the place. So that whenever you come to the place and you sit down there, then you can feel peaceful, and your mind becomes, it picks up on the vibrations, the peaceful vibrations, and so the mind easily settles down, and you experience this as something like a refuge, a place of security amidst all of the turmoil and disorder of everyday life. Okay, so one chooses a quiet, secluded place, and then one sits down. So mindfulness of breathing, it's a meditation subject to be practiced in the sitting posture. I know some people do try to be aware of the breath while they're doing the walking meditation. I myself have found it very difficult to maintain a strong awareness of the breath while also trying to be aware of walking. So my own, at least my own way of practice, if one wants to do mindfulness of breathing, do it in the sitting posture. And if one is going to do, be walking back and forth, then do another meditation, usually the mindfulness of walking. Okay, then when one sits down, then one folds the legs crosswise. It doesn't have to be the full lotus, it can be half lotus, quarter lotus, or what they call sometimes the Burmese posture. This is where one leg is on the ground, the other leg is like this. The legs are, aren't actually crossed. They're not crossed so that one is on top of another, but the two legs are sort of parallel against one another on the ground or on the mat. And then one keeps the body erect. This is extremely important. So, one positions first the head so that the nose is directly above the belly button. First, hold the head as if one is looking straight out. And then one can let the head tilt downwards a slight angle, maybe about a 30 degree angle. 20, 30 degree angle, so it's slightly tilted downwards. 
then the mouth should be closed with the tongue resting lightly against the roof of the mouth and the eyes should be closed, lightly closed. Though in some traditions they teach to let the eyes remain very slightly open. But I personally find it easier to keep the eyes completely closed, but lightly, not forcing them closed. Okay, and then one establishes mindfulness in, in front, in front of one. Okay, now this is my understanding is that this expression, establishing mindfulness in front of you, the, I found the way the term used in the suttas, or the expression is used in a very general sense. So it's not specifically tied to mindfulness of breathing but it seems to be used just in a way, as a way of indicating that when one is sitting down to do meditation, one sets up mindfulness. But some of the early commentarial texts take this expression in a rather technical and precise way, and they explain it to mean that when one practices mindfulness of breathing, one establishes the mindfulness in an area, it can be under the nostrils, slightly inside the nostrils, or around the nostrils, wherever one feels the breath most clearly coming in and going out. Okay, what I have actually found, both with myself and with instructing others, that it's very difficult to keep the mindfulness sustained on this area right around the nostrils or slightly inside the nostrils. Because it seems to be a very, very subtle place and the, so the impact of the breath there is very subtle. So initially one might be able to keep the breath there for the attention there, the mindfulness for you know quite some time, like two or three breaths. <laughs> but then the mind starts wandering. So what I suggest doing, or this is what at least this is the technique that I found helpful. Initially when one sits down, one establishes the mindfulness in the body itself, so that one tries to keep the mindfulness spread out broadly throughout the body. So one is aware of the body itself as you know, taking in the whole mass of the body in one act of mindfulness, in one extended spread, let's say one spread of mindfulness. So one becomes mindful of the whole body, the body is a totality. And then one keeps the mindfulness spread out through the body for maybe half a minute or so. And then one becomes aware of breathing without focusing on a particular place, but just becoming aware of the breath the act of breathing in any way in which it stands out most clearly. So one might experience the expansion and contraction of the chest as sort of the most conspicuous manifestation of the breath, or the rising and falling of the abdomen. And so one follows the in and out breathing Wherever one experiences it most clearly and distinctly, without trying to home in too sharply on any one place. But then as the mind settles in on the breath, so that one could follow the in and out breathing fairly consistently, then one can gradually let the mind move to the area around the nostrils, slightly inside the nostrils, just beneath the nostrils, 
wherever one picks up the sensation of the breath most clearly. And then one lets the mind, I use the expression, let it sit comfortably on that area, not trying to push the mind onto that area, not forcing it, because that makes the mind tight and strains the mind, and it strains, could strain the muscles and nerves also. But just letting the mind rest or sit on that area very softly, very gently, and sort of the key to success the way I would formulate it, is to strike a healthy balance between consistency of awareness and softness or gentleness of awareness. So that the mind is not pushing itself into that area. So that you're not, you're not pushing the mind onto that area, but just letting it rest there almost as if one were taking a feather or a piece of cotton and putting it around the nostrils, almost as though it were like tickling the nostrils or the area just beneath the nostrils. Okay, and then one becomes mindful of the breath in that area. And if the mind, of course, initially, if it just wanders a few times, then one just notes it and brings the mind back to that area. But if the mind is wandering a lot, continuously wandering, then what I suggest is again bringing the mind back to this panoramic awareness of the body, keeping it simply being aware that there is the body, or simply aware of body, body, the presence of the body, maybe for about half a minute or a minute. Then again, becoming aware of the breath in whichever way, as one experiences it most clearly and distinctly in the body. Again, it could be the expansion and contraction of the chest. And then, as one is able to follow the conspicuous manifestation of the breath, then at a certain point one can again bring the mind back to the area around the nostrils and again focus upon it there. Okay, so this is how I would say that one keeps ever mindful he breathes in Mindful, he breathes out. In fact, that is like really, it's like that is the main instruction in mindfulness of breathing. It's really all sort of succinctly expressed in that one phrase, that one expression. Ever satova asasati, sato basasati, sato eva. That means mindful, and then that eva is somewhat emphatic. It doesn't literally mean ever, but it will mean like really mindful or definitely mindful. Emphatically mindful, he breathes in. Mindful, he breathes out. So that is the core instruction in mindfulness of breathing. And now what's going to take place in the following sections is an expansion of the mindfulness of breathing into 16, sometimes called 16 steps or 16 aspects. And as we'll see, these 16 aspects actually fall into four groups of four, four tetrads. And the four tetrads are determined or governed by the four foundations of mindfulness, the four bases of mindfulness. And so the first tetrad is 
mindfulness of breathing viewed in terms of contemplation of the body. This is the way we find mindfulness of breathing explained or expounded in the Satipatthana Sutta, the discourse on the establishment of mindfulness. Okay, so here the text says, breathing in, excuse me, <coughs> breathe, <coughs> excuse me again, <coughs> breathing in long, he understands, I breathe in long, or breathing out long, he understands, I breathe out long. And we'll take the next pair of us, they go together. Breathing in short, he understands, I breathe in short. Or breathing out short, he understands, I breathe out short. Now what's interesting here to note is the verb in these two sentences. The verb is what's translated as understands, and in Pali, this verb is pajanati. And the verb pajanati is the verb from which we derive the noun panya, which is usually translated in wisdom. But here, it seems to me pajanati is not really suggesting any kind of deep wisdom or insight, but it's, maybe you could say that it's a discernment or a discerning of the quality of the breath, whether the breath is long where the breath is short. I don't know if, where one precisely delineates the distinction, but where one precisely draws the distinction between a long breath and a short breath. But in one's own experience, one can see whether the breath is relatively long or relatively short. It's been a bit of a puzzle to me I don't know the solution to the puzzle. Why the text begins with the long breath and follows it with the short breath? Because in my experience, and I think in almost everybody's experience, when one sits down and begins breathing, the breathing initially is short, shorter, because the breaths are coming more quickly. <coughs> But then as the mind and body settle down and the mind becomes more focused, then the breathing seems, or it slows down, and so the breath becomes longer. Anybody have any idea about this? <laughs> Andrea? Yeah. Actually, I usually find the opposite, Bonte. Once they really, really get calmed down, I, don't, I almost seem to hardly breathe at all. Actually, that is the case, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is also the case, yeah, yeah. Is it more common to focus on the long breath first? The way it's laid out in the sutta is, it's as if one focuses first on the long breath and then on the short breath. But I think Andrea made a good point that also, as the breath becomes calmer, the breathing slows down, so the breathing is... It's almost like you're not breathing. Yeah, the breathing starts to become longer, but then become, as the breath becomes subtler, then it seems that you call it a shorter breath. So maybe the original distinction is not, as we understand, long breath and short breath, but maybe a gross breath and a subtle breath.
Anybody else? Somebody else? Well, maybe, he, maybe he was breathing in long intentionally in the beginning in order to calm himself by taking a deep breath, letting out a deep breath a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, usually we say in the instructions on mindfulness of breathing that one shouldn't re- intentionally regulate the breath, you know, trying to make it either long or short, but just breathe naturally through the nostrils and then follow the breath just as it's occurring. Yeah, but this is why at a certain point it becomes longer as we go on attending to it rather than shorter. But I'm going to go with the way the explanation I'm trying to give. Okay, so these are, however we understand it, the first two sort of steps to be aware of the breath as long or short. Then we come into the, well, the third aspect. And here the verb trains again. He trains thus, I shall breathe in, experiencing the whole body. I shall, he trains thus, I shall breathe out, experiencing the whole body. Actually, there are two changes in the verb that take, that take place here. One is the the main verb, and that is now the change is from understanding to training, which is sikati. And then the other change in the verb is in the verb within the quote marks, and that is it's changing from present tense to future tense, because one is making a determination, one is training oneself to do something. And so the future expresses the mode in which one will undertake that training. And the particular mode which is um, indicated by the statement, I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body. Let me write this whole thing in Pali, though it's a big, big compound. Okay, so Sabha means all or entire. Kaya means body. And Pati Sanvedi comes from the verb Pati Sanvedeti, which means to experience. So Pati Sanvedi, experiencing. Now the commentaries have a way of explaining this, which has been sort of taken over in the Theravada tradition. And I'm not so sure that the commentarial explanation captures the original meaning. And I should say, as a precaution, we have here the 16 aspects or steps of mindfulness of breathing, and different meditation teachers, meditation masters, give different explanations of this, these 16 aspects. So, 
you know, if you read Achan Buddha Dasa, he had a book on mindful. I think it's, this is called Mindfulness Through Breathing, Mindfulness with Breathing. He gives an explanation of the 16 steps. Take Not Han, I think, has a book, and he gives his explanation. Probably Pao Soyador gives an explanation, and other Soyadors and Achans will give their explanations. And I think Goenka has his ex- system of explanation. So there are different ways of explaining. So there's not just one fixed mold. So different teachers have different ways of explaining these. Okay, now, the way which prevails in the Theravada tradition is based on the explanation in Visuddhi Mata, the path of purification. And that explains to experience the whole body means to be aware of an entire breath from the very beginning of the breath through the, call it the middle portion of the breath, right to the very end of the breath. And then when one is breathing out, then one becomes aware of the very beginning of the out-breath, the whole middle portion of the out-breath, and the very end moment of the out-breath. And so one is making a deliberate, intentional effort to follow each in-breath and each out-breath through its entire course. Okay, it seems to me that this particular instruction, it's very important for developing consistent, for developing consistent, sustained mindfulness of the breath. But I find it difficult to see that explanation in the actual phrase Sabakaya Patisamvedi because Kaya is almost always used to refer to the physical body and Sabha emphasizes, seems to emphasize this, the whole body, the entire body. And the verb or the word Patisamvedi doesn't seem to me to me to mean simply to be aware of in the sense of to know or to be following, but to be experiencing. It's actually patisattvedi is related to the verb vedeti, which means to feel, and the noun vedana, feeling. So it seems to be a much more tactile aspect of experience, a much more concrete and tactile aspect of experience than simply noting or being aware of. And so the way I would understand it, and this is very personal, it could be wrong, but Sabakaya Patisamvedi means that as one is following the breath at the nostrils, around the nostrils, one is also becoming more aware of the whole body. And so there can take place simultaneously an awareness of the breath as it is entering and leaving around the nostrils and of the entire body as it's sitting there, in the sitting posture. And also, as one's awareness of the body, uh, one's awareness of the breath strengthens, one also feels more distinctly, more clearly, the, let us say, the spread of the breath through the whole body. So one doesn't shift the attention away from the area around the nostrils. One keeps the attention focused in that area, but still the experience is now taking in the body in its concrete actuality or in its actual tactile concreteness.
Okay, then we come to the fourth aspect, which is tranquilizing the what's called the bodily formation. So I shall breathe in, tranquilizing the bodily formation. I shall breathe out, tranquilizing the bodily formation. Now the bodily formation, the Pali word is kaya sankara. And this is identified, well first I'll write it. Yeah, this is identified in Sutta number 44. On page 399, the bodily formation or bodily activity is identified with in-breathing and out-breathing. So this is in paragraph 15 on page 399. In-breathing and out-breathing are bodily states bound up with the body. That is why in-breathing and out-breathing are the bodily formation. So rather than use the full expression in and out-breathing, here the text uses the expression bodily formation. And the way I understand it, one is not sort of making a deliberate, intentional effort to tranquilize the bodily formation, but one is simply being mindful of the breath coming in and going out. But as one becomes more and more mindful of the breathing, then naturally the breathing itself becomes calmer, more tranquil, and more subtle, so that eventually it seems that the breathing becomes so subtle that one is hardly aware of pulling air in through the, the, through the nostrils and sending it out through the nostrils. And then it's said that as the breathing becomes more and more subtle, at a certain point, one enters into the jhanas, or states of deep concentration, and then in the fourth absorption, the fourth jhana, the in and out breathing stop altogether. So it's in the fourth, breath, fourth jhana that the in-breath and out-breath become completely tranquilized, completely still, or quiet. Okay, so this is the section on contemplation of the body. Does anybody have any questions on this? No, no, just if there's a microphone, do we have the, 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 the body versus bodily formation? Is formation, does that mean the same thing there that formation means in mental formation? And why say bodily formation rather than just body? What, what is formation really there for? Yeah, I, I don't actually like the word um, formation as a translation of sankara. This is sort of an old translation that I inherited. And the word sankara has different different connotations. Maybe we could say here activity maybe is a more satisfactory rendering. So, in, and what's being referred to is not the body itself, but in and out breathing as an activity of the body. Yeah, but I point, the passage I pointed out from Sutta number 44, that in breathing and out breathing are bodily, their states bound up with the body, 
Therefore, they're called the bodily sankara. Okay, so then that understanding of, of formation would also apply to mental formation, so that what's meant by mental formation is why it's, it's mental activity, meaning the will and any kind of uh, any kind of active ideation as opposed to, say, store of consciousness and see, right? This is a big question that opens up a big topic. Um, because the word mental formation or mental activity, yeah. well, let's say the word sankara is used in different contexts with different connotations. Um, so in some contexts, body kaya sankara means activities, volitional activities performed through the body, like killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, those are types of unwholesome bodily sankharas. But in the context of meditation practice, the expression bodily activity, kaya sankhara, is used with reference to in and out breathing. And we co- will come across mental sankharas just below. In relation to meditation, the mental sankhara means feeling and perception. But in other contexts, the mental formations or mental activities mean volitional activities that occur through the mind without coming to expression through body and speech. If you want to explore this further, we could do so after lunch in the discussion period. Okay, one question. I, there are so many questions, but I won't have to finish the sutta today before the... But somebody says, if attention is a shifted to the whole physical body away from the breath itself, doesn't it disturb the one-pointedness tending to samadhi? I didn't say that the attention is shifted to the physical body. Oh, I didn't say that the attention is shifted away from the breath itself. What I said is that the attention remains on the breath, but one becomes more aware of the physical body, or one experiences what I call the concrete, tactile reality of the physical body. But the attention still remains on the area around the nostrils. Somebody asks, does being aware of the long breath and short breath simply mean to be aware of the breaths as they are? Well, one is aware of the breaths as they are, but it seems here one is deliberately distinguishing whether the breath is long or whether it's short. Otherwise, it seems simply being aware of the breaths as they are is indicated by the first phrase, ever mindful he breathes in, mindful he breathes out. Is it possible to enter jhana as early as the fourth step of the sixteen steps, or does it happen at the end of the ninth step? This is a rather technical question. It seems to me, and this is a point I wanted to make anyway, that the first three tetras, the first three twelve steps, are looking at the same process from different points of view, from different perspectives, that they are each looking at the process of intensifying concentration, intensified samadhi. But the first tetrad is looking at it from the standpoint of the body, the second from the standpoint of feeling, 
the third from the standpoint of mind. And so I see, the way I look at it, that all three of these tetrads are looking at the process by which mindfulness of breathing is used to enter jhana. Even though jhana is not explicitly mentioned in the suttas on mindfulness of breathing. So as, especially as the breathing becomes tranquilized, being aware of the tranquilizing the bodily formation, this indicates the tranquilizing of the breath as one approaches and enters the jhana and takes it up to the level of the fourth jhana where the breathing becomes completely tranquilized. Okay, I want to move on now to the second tetrad, which is the way I look at it, as I said, it's now ex- taking the process of mindfulness of breathing and looking at what is happening in terms of feeling. And we find this explicitly stated in the sutta on mindfulness of breathing, that's 118 of the Majjhima Okay, so now I shall breathe in experiencing rapture. I shall breathe out experiencing rapture. I shall breathe in experiencing pleasure. I shall breathe out experiencing pleasure. And so we have here two important words in or two words that indicate important factors in the development of samadhi, or concentration. Okay, the two words are piti piti and sukha piti is what we translate as rapture I'm not so happy with it but it's hard to find an adequate rendering could be joy or elation and technically piti isn't classified as a feeling, but piti and sukha, the other word is sukha, which is rendered here as pleasure. These two uh, these two mental factors often occur very closely associated, but piti is more like an exuberance of bliss, a kind of ecstatic feeling, an uplifting joy. And sukha is the... Sukha is itself the feeling. It's the pleasant feeling. And so in the initial stage, piti and sukha, rapture and pleasure, occur together. But rapture is a more colorful character. It's like, you know, if two women go to a dance and one is dressed in a red and green and blue dress and the other comes in a pale yellow dress, then the one who's going to sort of stand out is the one wearing the red, green and blue dress. And so every, all the eyes will be on her, and the one with the pale yellow dress will sort of be in the background. 
out of the center of attention. And so what first dominates in the experience of deepening meditation is this rapture. And so I think rapture is included in this section because it arises as the concentration, as, as the mind is becoming concentrated, then when it's clear the hindrances are falling away and the mind is collected on the object, there arises this joy or this exuberance and that becomes the center of attention. But one is still focusing on the breath, still aware of breathing in, breathing out, but now one is experiencing rapture as one is aware of breathing in and breathing out. Okay, as the concentration deepens and one becomes more familiar with it, then the breath, I'm sorry, the rapture starts to fall away, to fade into the background. Maybe it's a little bit like those two women just enter the dance, <laughs> the party. <laughs> And so initially the one with the bright red and blue dress stands out, but if one chats with them and gets to know them a little bit, one finds the one with the yellow, pale yellow dress <laughs> is, has a more interesting or more deeper personality. <laughs> okay, so very worldly illustration. <laughs> Okay, so as the mind becomes more concentrated, the rapture loses its interest, so to speak, and eventually it will subside as the jhanic experiences unfold, as one moves from the first jhana to the second, then from the second jhana to the third, in the transition from the second to the third, piti, or rapture, falls away, and there remains only the pleasure, the sukha, without the rapture. Okay, then in the third step, he trains, I shall breathe in, experiencing the mental formation. I shall breathe out, experiencing the mental formation. And then I shall breathe in tranquilizing the mental formation. I shall breathe out tranquilizing the mental formation. And here we come across the expression mental formation that Richard brought up before. This is Chitta Sankara, and according to page 399 that we looked at a few moments ago, Again, paragraph 15, perception and feeling are mental states bound up with the mind. That is why perception and feeling are the mental formation. So what's indicated by mental formation is perception and feeling. And since the process of meditation here isn't particularly concerned with perception, so it seems what's being focused on is the feeling. So one is breathing in, breathing out, experiencing the feeling. And I don't quite know why feeling is, or let's say the mental formation is mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, that, that puzzles me because the, the five skandhas usually list feeling, perception, and mental formation separately. And if feeling, perception, or the mental formation, then why is the mental formation listed? Yeah, this is a, I mean, it's an interesting question about Pali terminology and how these words came to be understood. In the five aggregates, the aggregate of mental formations, or sankhara, are the factors connected with volition. It's chaitana, volition, the intentional factors. And perception and feeling, or feeling and perception, are the headings for other aggregates. But in this particular scheme, feeling and perception become the mental formation, the chitta sankara. 
Well, that, that surprises me because normally he's very consistent with these usages. Like he has, you know, he has this, this, this uh, scheme that he applies very consistently. And that's yeah, I have to say it's also, I mean, it's puzzling to me. I don't have the answer to that. Unless he, you know, unless he was picking up terms that were sort of in usage in the contemplative communities of that period. But then why use a word in one context in which it has one application and then in another context in which it has another applica uh, application. I just don't have the answer. Could, could it be a corruption of the text? Or the no, I don't think so, because we find that the use of these words consistent between different Nikayas, and so it seems to be pretty, I mean, deliberate, and it could be a corruption. The corruption would just mean like a bad reading, which one could find maybe in one text, and then one could see that it's a corruption because of other texts which give different readings. Okay, so it seems to me anyway that here, if mental formation is taken as feeling, then it's being used in a broader sense. It's not just the pleasure, but it could be the pleasant feeling and also the feeling of equanimity or the neutral feeling. So it's all comprised under the heading of mental formation. And maybe here also, even when it's a pleasant feeling, when one is experiencing it, one is not attending to it under the heading of being pleasant, pleasant or pleasurable, but rather just experiencing it as a feeling. And then in the next step, one is tranquilizing the mental formation. And that means one is through continuing to focus on in and out breathing. One is making the feeling become subtler and subtler. So the pleasant feeling moves from, you know, the approach to the jhana. When one enters into the jhana, it's subtler than it was earlier. When one comes to the second jhana, it's still a subtler feeling of pleasure. When one comes to the third jhana, it's an extremely subtle feeling of pleasure. When one comes to the fourth jhana, then the pleasant feeling subsides and it's replaced by neutral feeling or equanimous feeling. So this is tranquilizing the mental formation. Okay, now we come to the third tetrad, and this is looking at the process of mindfulness of breathing from the perspective of citta, or the mind. And so the first one is, I shall breathe in, I shall breathe out, experiencing the mind. The Pali word here, the Pali expression, Chitta Pati Sanvedi. You know, and all along, you know, as one is doing mindfulness of breathing, of course the mind is always present. Without the mind being present, one couldn't be mindful of the breath. But what seems to be indicated here is that at a certain point, the mind itself, the chitta, as a component of the experience, becomes more prominent. You know, initially, one is just trying to keep the mind on the breath, coming in, going out, coming in, going out. But now, one is becoming aware of the mind as a factor involved in that experience. And perhaps one is also becoming more aware of the mental factors. You know, one could see when a particular hindrance arises in the mind, or a particular 
quality of the mind, that the mind is connected with attachment, with ill will, with delusion, or that the mind, as it's becoming more mindful, the mind is separating from attachment, separating from ill will, separating from delusion. So one has become more aware of the quality of the mind and the factors that are operating in the mind. Okay, then the second stage, I shall breathe in gladdening the mind. I shall breathe out gladdening the mind. Okay, this seems to indicate that as one's concentration on the mind is increasing, and the mind is becoming, or is able to sustain its attention more consistently on the breath, then what is arising is piti and sukha. That is, it's the rapture and pleasure arising, and that is what is causing the gladdening of the mind. But we take rapture and pleasure, we're looking at it from the standpoint of feeling. But when we take it from the standpoint of mind, then we speak about the gladdening of the mind. The mind is being suffused with rapture and with pleasure. Okay, then the next step, I shall breathe in, I shall breathe out, concentrating the mind. Okay, this is what one has been attempting to do all along. And as the rapture and pleasure arise, gladdening the mind, this is a kind of indication that the mind is becoming more concentrated. But if one becomes sort of attracted or latches on to the rapture and the pleasure, then the mind becomes distracted, loses the object. And so what one has to do is sort of let the rapture, let the pleasure take their own course and just continue to focus on the in and out breathing. And as one does so, the mind becomes more concentrated, the concentration deepens, and then one, as the concentration deepens, then one enters into the meditative absorptions the jhanas. Okay, then comes the fourth step. I shall breathe in liberating the mind. I shall breathe out liberating the mind. Now the way the commentaries explain this, and here I would agree with them, liberating the mind here doesn't mean completely eradicating the defilements in order to reach final liberation. But rather, what it means is one is releasing or letting go of the coarser mental states in order to enter upon subtler levels of concentration. So initially, in the preliminary stages of training, one has to liberate the mind by letting go the five hindrances by freeing the mind from the five hindrances. Then, to deepen the concentration, one has to let go of, to go, as one lets go of the five hindrances, then one comes into the first jhana. But then to move to the deeper jhanas, one has to liberate the mind, first from thinking and examination, which are factors of the first jhana, then one has to liberate the mind from rapture to move from the second to the third jhana, and then one has to liberate the mind from pleasure to move from the third jhana to the fourth jhana. So this is not the full or final liberation of mind that occurs through wisdom, through insight or wisdom, but this is releasing the mind from the coarser, grosser mental factors in order to allow the mind to move to the subtler factors in order to deepen the samadhi, 
the concentration. Okay, now I'm going to have to go a bit quickly in order to finish the whole sutta. I have to apologize for being a bit, <laughs> a bit concise. Okay, now the fourth tetrad, the way I understand it, marks a significant shift in emphasis. The first three tetrads, in the first three tetrads, the emphasis is on samadhi, on concentration, or on samatha, on stilling the mind or tranquilizing the mind. The fourth tetrad shifts the emphasis to insight. Here one is using mindfulness of breathing as a vehicle for contemplating the nature of experience in order to gain insight into the three characteristics. And so the text begins with, actually the first three sections are all focusing on the mark of impermanence, but under different headings. So here it starts, I shall breathe in contemplating impermanence, I shall breathe out contemplating impermanence. Okay, so what one does is use, one shifts the awareness from simply focusing upon the area where one experiences the breath coming in or going out, to one shifts the emphasis from that particular spot to the actual occurrence of the in-breaths and the out-breaths themselves. And so one notices when breathing in, one identifies this is an in-breath, when breathing out, one becomes aware this is an out-breath. And so one starts to see now the distinction of in-breaths, out-breaths, in-breaths, out-breaths. And one sees that when the in-breath is occurring, there's no more out-breath. When the out-breath, when the in-breath is stopped, the out-breath is occurring. That is an out-breath. And so one is seeing how in-breath, out-breath succeed one another. When one stops, the other starts. And so this is now getting a focus on impermanence. And as one focuses in more subtly, one sees in each in-breath how the breathing is occurring in stages. So that one starts to breathe in, then one comes into the middle phase of the in-breath, one comes to the end phase of the in-breath. Each stage is distinct from the other. And one sees the stopping moment of the in-breath. And then one sees the starting moment of the out-breath, the middle phase of the out-breath, the terminal phase of the out-breath, the pause at the end of the out-breath. And so each phase is distinct from the other. And then the attention can focus in more and more at subtler and subtler levels until one sees in each in-breath the breath occurring in sort of little quantum packets, moment after moment after moment, each moment distinct from the preceding moment. And similarly with the out-breath, one sees it as a stream of packets of out-breathing. Each is occurring, each has its arising and passing away. And so one is now seeing at very subtle levels arising and passing away in each in-breath and each out-breath. Then coming to the next stage, I shall breathe in contemplating the raga fading away. I shall breathe out contemplating fading away. The way I see this is that one is now shifting the attention from the arising and passing away to now just focusing on the passing away aspect or the dissolution of each packet of experience in the in-breath, in the out-breath. 
And so countless times, as one is breathing in, that experience of the bodily act of breathing in and the awareness of breathing in is passing away, fading away, seizing, 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 or dissolving, dissolving, dissolving. And with each outbreath, countless times, the bodily act of breathing, the mental awareness, is breaking up, dissolving away. So that is contemplating fading away in the out-breath, in the out in the in-breath, in the out-breath. Then the next pair, I shall breathe in contemplating cessation, I shall breathe out contemplating cessation. Okay, the way I see it here, as one is breathing in, one sees that each packet of experience has seized. From moment to moment that it sees, it doesn't exist with the next moment. And so here one is getting a really the most powerful experience of impermanence. Because one is seeing how each experience, when, the, when a new experience occurs, the previous moment of experience is gone, it's stopped, it's past. And so this is becoming the most vivid, the most powerful experience of impermanence through seeing the cessation of every occasion of experience. And then comes the fourth stage, fourth aspect, which is breathing in, contemplating relinquishment, breathing out, contemplating relinquishment. And this is the relinquishing of any kind of attachment that occurs as through the contemplation of the impermanence fading away and cessation. As one is contemplating this, one is giving up the attachment or the defilements. Okay, so this takes us through, rather quickly, through the 16 stages or aspects of mindfulness of breathing. And then the Buddha just summarizes and he says that is how mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated so that it is of great fruit and great benefit. And then he adds an extra benefit, he says, when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated in this way, even the final in-breaths and out-breaths are known as they cease, not unknown. So what this means is that if one is experienced in developing mindfulness of breathing, then as one enters into one's final moments, the death process, one could turn the attention to the breath, the in and out breath, and one could be aware of one's in-breaths and out-breaths as they are occurring right up to the moment that one comes to the final end of the breathing process. So one could pass away in complete mindfulness of the breath. Okay, let's see if there's internet questions, I'll take them now, and then in, in-house questions we could take for the discussion period. Okay, if mental formation also means volition and will, maybe tranquilizing the mental formation means paying attention to letting go of ego's willfulness at the eighth step. Still, I think here in the context of the explanation of mindfulness of breathing, we have to take the expression mental formation. Of course, it could mean will also, but usually in meditative context, it's explained as perception and feeling. But maybe we could also include will in there and say like tranquilizing perception, feeling, and willfulness. Okay, then some say that 
Piti or rapture is physical and sukha is mental. Is this correct? I don't think I've heard this before, but they're both mental, but piti, rapture, can maybe expresses itself in certain physical manifestations, like they can take place when piti is occurring, sometimes people get goosebumps, or we call it the hair standing on the edge, or maybe feelings of like a coolness or a heat rising and spreading through the body. But as a mental factor, it's actually, in its essence, it's actually a mental factor, the, that experience of joy or exuberance. Okay, we'll end the, the actual class now. We break for the lunch, and if anybody wants, has more questions, please, we will meet again, let's say, 10 after 12, quarter after 12, and we could have 20, 30 minute discussion. And then just to repeat, for the next two weeks, we won't have a class, the 24th and the December 31st. The next class will be on January 7th, and next time we will do the it's called the Malakya Puta Sutta, the larger discourse to Malakya Puta. That's number 64 in the Bajimini Kaya. Okay, so let us end by sharing the merits, sharing with the devas, the deities, the nagas, the dragon spirits, the Buddhas or the fierce beings, asking them to rejoice in the merits, to protect the Buddha's teachings, to protect the world, to protect ourselves and others. Akasata Jabhumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanamo Deva Chiram Rakantu Sasana Akasata Jabhumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanamo Deva Chiram Rakantu Desana Akasata Jabhumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanamo Deva Chiram Rakantu Mantra Eta Vatacham Hehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Deva Namo Dantu Sabha Sampati Siddhiya Sabe Bhuta Namo Dantu Sabha Sampati Siddhiya Sabe Sada Namo Dantu Sabha Sampati Siddhiya Bhava Gupadaya Vichihe Tato E Tantare Sata Kayupapana Rupi Arupi Cha Asanya Sanino Dukha Pamuchantu Pusantu Nibuti And I wish everybody a happy new, happy, Merry Christmas and a happy new year. Okay, we stand up and we end with three short comments. Ooh. Without the mindfulness of your Okay, you could just clang the chime there. Please give your contact information to me.
Oh. Uh, I can teach you today after the Okay, yeah, discussion. good, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. 